Shalom, me homies. It's Alex again with Formidable Felons, and I hope that you liked our last two videos, part one and part two of the investigation of Lowell Correctional Institution. Today, we're going to be talking about part three of the investigation. If you haven't already, please, please, please like and subscribe. It really, really helps me grow my channel and helps me spread the information that I'm trying to get for my fellow Formidable Felons. So we're going to get right into it, starting with the inadequate systems for preventing, detecting, and responding to sexual abuse that place low prisoners at substantial risk of serious harm from staff sexual abuse. Uh, you know, in the first video, we did talk about the history of Lowell, what, um, how many inmates that it held, excuse me, that it holds, and also how many staff there are to be in control of those inmates. It also states what uh, the Eighth Amendment is and what precautions needed to be taken in order to secure inmates' livelihood and also their constitutional rights as well. The second video was explaining more the instances of what happened, uh, several cases of officers stalking and blackmailing, molesting and raping individuals and that are incarcerated and taking full advantage of their position of power. And I tried my hardest to put faces and names to those, um, to what is investigated in here, because it does say Lieutenant, Sergeant, I had to take the time to try and find the news articles that pinpoint exactly the same evidence that is stated in this investigation. So I tried to do my hardest on that, and I really hope you guys enjoy it. I'll put a link into the video as well. So as I said, we're getting right into it. The inadequate systems for preventing and detecting and responding to sexual abuse. So Lowell exposes women prisoners to a substantial risk of serious harm from sexual abuse because it provides inadequate supervision of prisoners, which presents opportunities for sexual abuse to occur. So there's no cameras can't get all of the angles and half the time officers are too caught up in themselves to be fully paying attention to all of the inmates. There's also 70 people at a time in the dorm. So number two, it deters prisoners from reporting staff sexual abuse due to the threat of retaliation, which we just, which we covered in the second video. And it fails to respond with appropriate investigations when women do not report abuse and fails to provide effective and confidential reporting mechanisms. A lack of gender res response and trauma-informed policies and practices exacerbates this problem and exposes victims to additional harm. These systematic deficiencies combine to result in Lowell's failure to protect women prisoners from the harm of sexual abuse. Let's start number one. Lowell's policies and practices enable sexual abuse of prisoner, prisoners by staff by failing to ensure a reasonably safe environment. So severe staffing shortages at Lowell result in inadequate supervision of women prisoners, exposing them to the substantial risk of harm from sexual abuse of they say they're low staff, but they've always had staff. I mean, there were people that did work multiple shifts, but I didn't hear too much of a shortage of the staff. There's definitely, definitely more men than women, though, as when it comes to officers. The Lowell Correctional, sorry, understaffing is an almost constant problem at Lowell, with designated security posts often left vacant due to inadequate numbers of staff on duty. That part of the the Lowell Correctional Institution staffing plan provides for security staffing positions at level one, two, and three, with level one positions the most essential. Internal reviews have repeatedly concluded that unless posts at all levels are filled according to the staffing plan, supervision and monitoring are inadequate to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment allegations. In spite of the mandate to ensure that all posts are filled, the actual deployment of staff at Lowell consistently fails to meet adequate staffing levels. So staff vaccines and staff, oh sorry, staff vacancies and staff availability to work are serious problems at Lowell. For example, during a three-day period from February 2012 to 14, 2018, daily security staff rosters for Lowell, Maine, indicated that vacancy rates among security staff were approximately 15%, meaning that 15% of security posts were not filled at all. On top of these vacancy rates, staff availability to work is extremely low, further reducing the number of staff actually working at the facility. 
On February 14, 2018, 41% of security staff scheduled to work were either on leave, out for training, or on special assignment, with only 59% recorded as working their assigned security posts. And on February 12th of 13, 2018, Daily security staff rosters for Lola and X on January 22nd, 2018 indicated similarly concerning vacancy rates and unmanned posts. Vacancy rates among security staff were approximately 14%. Only 15, 59% of security staff were working, while the other 35% filled posts were unmanned. Throughout 2017 and 2018, oh, my cat is here. Throughout 2017 and 2018, staff vacancies were recorded at high levels. Reports logging vacant staffing of level one posts for level for Lowell, Maine, January 1, 2017 through December 31st, 2017. Indicate a total of 1,104 level one shifts were vacant between January 1st and December 21st, 20, 31st, 2017. For a total of over 13,000 hours. For the period between January 1 and August 20th, 2018, 113 level one shifts were vacant totaling over 1,300 hours. The vast majority of these vacancies were housing officer shifts, that is, post-supervising prisoners on housing units. Lowell's adequate staffing levels result in security staff frequently being reassigned on an ad hoc basis to secondary posts, leaving primary security posts vacant. The staffing plan indicates that all level one, two, and three posts should be filled with additional posts for special assignments and that these posts should be fully staffed. In practice, however, as noted in the 2018 staffing plan, security staff are often reassigned from their designated spots to secondary duties or special assignments, leaving posts vacant. The Lowell Annual Prea Staffing Review identified 141 times in 2000... My cat keeps messing this whole thing up. <laughs> Reviewed 141 times in 2017 when staffing levels fell below critical meaning level one posts were left vacant due to secondary duties. These secondary duty reassignments can lead to dangerous gaps in security staff coverage. I'm also pretty sure that they do this on purpose as well and putting officers in other special assignments and special duties so that they can have their way and do what they want to do with inmates while nobody's looking because they put them somewhere else. Because open bay housing units are assigned two supervisory staff each, only one of whom is designated level one. Anytime the second assigned officer is redirected to perform secondary duties, such as dining, supervision, pill line, or escorts, a single officer is left to supervise an entire housing unit alone. That does happen often. This means one officer may be responsible for supervising, on average, anywhere from approximately 60 to well over 100 prisoners. The problem of staffing shortages at Lowell has been highlighted repeatedly by internal and third-party reviews as a risk factor placing prisoners at risk for sexual abuse. In a 2016 email to the Lowell PREA manager, the FDOC PREA coordinator cautioned that posts were left vacant for hours at a time due to secondary duty reassignments. Serious staffing shortages were also highlighted in a staffing assessment conducted in November 2016 by the Association of State Ordered, uh, excuse me, Association of State Correctional Administrators, ASCA, and in a November 2015 study of FDOC operations ordered by the Florida legislator and conducted by a third-party consulting company. The Lowell's chronic staffing problems are due in part to a failure to retain qualified staff and a high staff turnover rate, which requires the facility to constantly invest in training large numbers of new staff. Indeed, during the one-year period from May 21st, 2018 to May 21st, 2019, 149 staff were hired. Although the warden at the time of our first tour told us she had hired over 700 new staff in the previous three years. The continued high staff vacancy rate in spite of this level of hiring demonstrates problems with attrition. Because of the high staff turnover rate at Lowell, staff are often young and inexperienced. The trainee eligibility age was recently lowered from 19 to 18. Our expert noted that such a high turnover and high proportion of new, untrained, inexperienced staff leads to instability, prisoners feeling insecure and anxious in their environment, and makes prisoners more vulnerable to predatory behavior. And by predatory behavior, we of course mean the officers that are going out of their way to humiliate these inmates, to use them to get off, to take advantage of their power, 
so that the inmate does not have any sense of self. And so Lowell's severe understaffing problems results in inadequate supervision and creates an unacceptably high risk of sexual abuse by creating the opportunity for staff to engage in misconduct without detection. The ongoing staffing deficiencies at Lowell create an environment where staff is less likely to notice other staff taking advantage of vulnerable prisoners and where those engaging in unlawful schemes can easily avoid supervision and camera surveillance. In many cases, sexual abuse has occurred during the night when an officer is supervising one or more housing units alone or during other times of insufficient staffing coverage. And I've personally seen it myself where they'll be taking people to pill line and in the meantime, the officer that's left on duty will call an inmate, hey, Thomas, get over here, come clean the bubble. And go in the bubble, you don't see them for another like half hour. Sometimes they're just having conversation and you do see them, but there's times that you can see it's a clear space that is about six feet above the ground. You walk into the door through outside, go up a little incline and it overlooks the dorm. So you can see who's in there. And then sometimes they go in there and they disappear and you have the dorm to yourself for a few minutes. So it's really important that I bring to light my stories as well of the things that I've seen to back up firsthand the evidence that they've shown here in the lack of staffing that they have and people taking that to their advantage in order to get the things that they want to do on their side, items of their agenda. Failure to secure and monitor the physical plant of Lowell enables staff sexual abuse of prisoners. The effect of Lowell's staffing deficiencies is exasperated by a physical plant that is replete with blind spots and unsecured areas that are difficult to supervise and provide opportunities for abuse. In an effort to avoid detection, Lowell staff purposely exploit weaknesses in Lowell's physical structure and security practices to abuse prisoners, meaning that they go out of their way to go to these blind spots to abuse them. Surveillance camera coverage throughout the facility is inadequate to protect prisoners from unreasonable risk of harm from sexual abuse. Many alleged incidents of sexual abuse and other misconduct have occurred in areas without surveillance camera coverage or with inadequate coverage of entrances and exits. And like I said in one of the prior videos, when I got there in 2017 at Lowell, about two weeks later is when they installed the cameras and they had stories of inmates just in the youth offender program that would light bunks on fire and the amount of fighting and gang violence and everything before there were cameras, they just got them in 2017. And though it did provide a significant increase of safety, it also did leave still a significant amount of blind spots as well. So for example, in March, 2018, a sergeant allegedly raped a prisoner in a storage room near the foyer area of a dormitory in Lowell Annex. The allegations were supported by extensive photographic evidence, medical records of the prisoner's injuries, but there were no cameras in the foyer area and therefore no surveillance footage to review as part of the investigation. Lowell's physical plan includes spaces completely out of view of any common areas, security posts or other people with no surveillance camera coverage. These spaces include mezzanines, which are large attic spaces running the length of a housing unit dorm and HVAC rooms. In interviews with the department and in documented allegations of sexual abuse, these spaces were repeatedly noted as locations of staff sexual abuse of prisoners. During its first tour, the department had an opportunity to observe, to observe Lowell's physical plant to include areas where cameras were located, as well as areas that were and were not monitored by a camera. For example, in one dormitory, the department observed blind spots on camera angles within the laundry room, as well as in as an inoperative camera. Also in this particular dormitory, both prior to and during the tour, the department was made aware of a specific mezzanine, mezzanine, I kept saying that wrong, <laughs> where there was an alleged incident of sexual abuse. The department confirmed not only the absence of any cameras or other monitoring soft monitoring in the mezzanine area, but also observed that the area was clear risk for incidents of sexual abuse to take place given the size, which extended the length of the dormitory. Additionally, there, was al there were also no cameras at the back of this dormitory, such that the door leading to the mezzanine area was not monitored. During the department's second tour, we noted the absence of any cameras outside of some dormitories. 
despite the fact that these areas pose clear risk of sexual abuse, should be off limits to all prisoners and repeatedly have been raised to the attention of the OIG and Lowell authorities. They remain insufficiently covered by surveillance cameras or other monitoring. Lowell's warden informed the department in November 2019 that there are no plans for cameras to be installed in these areas. Although the warden stated that cameras will be placed on walkways around these areas, that is insufficient and cannot take the place of in-room camera coverage or other monitoring, especially given the frequency of reports alleging the use of these spaces for stat- for sexual abuse of prisoners. So I'm not a professional on this, but in my opinion, they keep those like that so that there is an opportunity for officers to handle the rowdy inmates and for any type of punishment that they deem necessary that is past writing all the paperwork, if they don't want to do that, they can take care of it on their own time. So the configuration of housing units at Lowell further contributes to an environment where there is an unacceptable risk of harm from sexual abuse because women prisoners are vulnerable to impermissible cross-gender viewing for reasons unrelated to security. And a side note underneath that, it says the PREA standards requires facilities to implement policies and procedures that enable inmates to shower, perform bodily functions, and change clothing without non-medical staff of the opposite gender viewing. So in many of the housing units in Lowell, Maine, and the Annex, including the youthful inmate dormitory, which is where I did my time, male staff can view the female prisoners while they are showering and using the toilet. It is absolutely true. Well, the bubble is right in the middle of the youth offender dorm. And there is the yellow hat side, which is on the east side, I believe it would be. And that is for the more remedial remedial trouble, they would call it. You don't have any canteen and you're on punishment and whatnot. And the other side on on the, it would be the west side, I believe, is the red hat and blue hat dorm and orange hat dorm. And If you guys would like a video on the levels of the youth offender program, please let me know. Orange is the beginning. Yellow, like I said, is remedial. Then it goes red, uh, which is uh, the next more, you get more um, benefits and whatnot. And the top of that is the blue hat. And you have, you're pretty much get a lot of priority in the program. And so there's the two there. And from the bubble, you can see part of the bathroom. You can see significantly into the end of the showers. And male staff, when they come in for count or if they're just coming in to do any type of just coming in at all, just to talk, just to walk around and just do their normal walkthrough, then they can immediately see who's in those showers. A lot of them have broken doors. And even still, there's only doors on like one side of them. It's it's really weird. So, in many open bay housing units at Lowell, Maine, and the Lowell Annex, the on unit officer station is elevated and situated between the two sides of the unit, as I was describing. Male staff in the officer stations have clear visibility into the bathrooms and can view the first row of toilets. That's absolutely true. Many showers have saloon style swinging double doors with a gap in the middle, resulting in women being exposed while showering. Yep. In some housing units, windows lining the external corridors allow male staff a view into the toilets and showers. In celled housing units, male officers can view prisoners while they're using the toilet. Some showers are equipped with doors or screens that cover only part of the prisoner's body from above the knees to below the shoulders of a prisoner of average height. And that's in dorms like in the Annex and Sierra. Like when you go to confinement, they take you to a, a shower that is part of the dorm and not in your own like unit. And in that shower... Uh, it's just like a sense picture, two sensor bars, but just made of metal. And then you just have a shower with people, a minimal, like three minute shower. And they're watching you to make sure that you don't have anything because you're in confinement. You're even absolutely stripped of the rights that you didn't have when you came in there to begin with. So depending on the height of the prisoner using the facilities, private parts of her body may be seen from outside the shower area especially with really tall women, you see that a lot. Having a configuration that allows for male staff to engage in prurient viewing of women prisoners while showering or using the toilet can create a sexualized environment that creates a risk of harm of sexual abuse and harassment. For example, several prisoners interviewed complain that male staff frequently comment on their bodies in a harassing manner. 
when the environment is such that a male staff have the ability to view women prisoners under these circumstances on a daily basis, the risk of harm is increased. And depending on what officer you have, I've been hit on in jail. I've also been called fat in jail, super ugly by officers. And it's depending on who you get and what their preference is. And they know that they could talk to you any type of way. The purpose is, especially in the youth program, to break you down in order to bring you up. I do understand it to some extent with tough love, but when you're telling a bunch of people that are still developing, especially when they're 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, that they're inmate shit bags and they don't even have a number, let alone a name, it's traumatizing to some extent. So attempts to mitigate privacy pr violations have been insufficient. For example, in late 2018 or 2019, a frosted film was added to some of the windows of the dorms such that individuals entering the dorm from the outside could not observe the bathroom and shower area. Still, male staff can see into these areas from the officer's station in part because anyone who is taller than average height can easily see over the frosted portion of the window. The behavior of Lowell staff exasper exas ooh. <laughs> the behavior of Lowell staff exacerbates these privacy violations. Staff can manipulate elements of physical plant to view women prisoners in the toilet and shower areas. When the department toured Lowell in November 2019, we observed that the mirrors in one dormitory had been turned so that the officers could see directly into the restroom shower area from their bubble. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all, but in knowing that you are in prison and you already have to watch your back for who's already around you, just other people, and the people that are supposed to be taking care of you and just making sure you're secure are purposely trying to watch you and trying to target you. So in the dormitory where the mirrors were turned, it was evident that the angle of the mirrors was intended to observe the restroom shower sh areas only, as the entry door area was not in view of the mir mirrors. When we brought this to management's attention, they brought in a maintenance team to adjust the direction of the mirrors, but the problem had been obvious and could have been corrected without the department commenting. Male staff also consistently failed to announce themselves when entering a housing unit or other areas where prisoners are showering or getting dressed. Although the 2019 PREA facility audit reports indicates that a majority of male staff announced themselves before entering in an area where prisoners might be undressed, Prisoners consistently reported to the department that this is not the case. Moreover, Lowell staff evidenced a lack, a lack clarity on the proper protocol for a male officer to announce himself. In interviews with the department, some officers stated that they believe the protocol is to announce once at the beginning of the shift in the morning with no obligation to announce again. Others informed us that they were required to announce every time a male corrections officer stepped into the housing unit. However, an announcement only at the beginning of a shift is clearly not adequate for providing prisoners with the opportunity to avoid exposure. Similarly, a sign indicating that male staff may be on duty at any time is not helpful. And I, in my experience, uh, they, there are in sorry, there are officers that do come in. They usually go male on the floor, and they will let them know. They'll knock like usually on the. Um, door of the bubble and let them know as well. And then there's other times that they just walk in and don't let anyone know, especially obviously at nighttime, they just come in and just walk through. And the little note up top, it says their breasts, buttocks, or genitalia except in extensions circumstances, or when such viewing is incidental to announce routine cell checks. These prohibitions are intended to prevent staff voyeurism, which predefines as sexual abuse and invasion of privacy of an inmate by staff for reasons unrelated to official duties, such as peering at an inmate who is using a toilet in his or her cell to perform bodily functions, requiring an inmate to expose his or her buttocks, genitals or breasts or taking images all or part of an inmate's naked body or of an inmate performing bodily functions. End quote of that. Two. Lull and OIG procedures and practices discourage prisoners from making reports of sexual abuse. Prisoner sexual abuse victims who face adverse consequences for reporting sexual abuse are much less likely to report the abuse. We identified this problem at Lull, where many prisoners the department interviewed during our investigation informed us that prisoners were punished or feared retaliation for making allegations against staff. These women's concerns are rooted, in fact. 
Prisoners at Lowell who make sexual abuse allegations routinely are placed in involuntary segregated housing, forfeiting access to regular programming, services, and property. Also, those services including visitation, phone calls, um, mail is also give or take. They do selectively take your mail. In addition, during our site visits, supervisory staff warned some of the prisoners that there would be negative consequences if they cooperated with the department's investigation. And I don't know if they saw that specifically from their own. It doesn't say that they said it, which they said, which was noted previously when they mentioned um, people like talking like in interviews and whatnot. They're saying it seems that they're saying that the super they saw the staff warning prisoners. And we've seen that before when we had um, if you Google Lowell, see, yeah, they had a Miami a Herald investigation, but they also mentioned us as one of the cleanest storms um, in Florida. And they did threaten with like, if we didn't make sure everything was pristine and clean. And if we told anyone what was actually like how horrible it was that we'd get sent to confinement, confinement was always used as a threat more than a solution to problems that couldn't be solved in the dorm. I've seen it thousands of times. Lowell routinely places sexual abuse victims in involuntary segregated housing. Prisoner victims of sexual abuse are less likely to report the abuse if a facility punishes the reporter. Punishment, as perceived by the rep reporting prisoner, may take forms such as loss of programs or privileges, programs meaning church, um, going to vocation, which happened to me when I went to confinement for a tattoo needle that wasn't mine over Christmas and New Year's when my mom was supposed to visit me. Um, that's nowhere near this, but... Um, placement in isolation or segregation and removal of property. Meaning when you go in confinement, sometimes they send you like in investigation, of course, you have to do like a week when you go in and you do have your uh, property. If they decide to give it to you, your letters, your clothing, whatever you're allowed to have in confinement, just like you're not allowed to have any sharp stuff, obviously. I think it's up to like three or four books. They do a minimal amount of things, and it's always a, when you go to confinement, people take your stuff. It's terrible. So you're losing your property, and then when you get back, the rest of your stuff's not there either. And they also sometimes, after that week, they might send you without your property for investigation, which they're not supposed to do. But then also, they can afterwards make sure that you don't have anything either. I was in confinement for a week under investigation without any hygiene at all. It was miserable. And I definitely made my bunkie miserable as well. <laughs> all right. So dozens of women reported that they believed prisoners who report sexual abuse are sent to confinement. This belief was corroborated by staff. For example, a sergeant we interviewed stated that prisoners are most definitely placed in handcuffs and taken to confinement after reporting abuse. That is like what I said previously, when you go, when you report a PREA case, they have to put it under investigation. Usually it's a minimum of six months that you have to sit there, like they said, without your programs, privileges, visitation, and phone. You're only writing your people by mail. And that's just while they're investigating. While the officer is still right out on the dorm, they're usually take very long to start that investigation and half the time they just drop it. So this belief was corroborated by staff. For example, a sergeant we interviewed stated that prisoners are most definitely hand placed in handcuffs and taken to confinement after report reporting abuse. As I said, the same sergeant indicated that prisoners do not get visitation when placed in administrative confinement, like I said. Uh, the notes is say... See what is required by the cross-gender announcement of standard 115.15 and 115.315 of the National pre Resource Center. In adult prisons and jails, staff of the opposite gender are required to announce their presence when entering an inmate housing unit. This is sometimes referred to as the cover-up rule and is intended to put inmates on notice when opposite gender staff may be viewing them. When the status quo of the gender supervision on a housing unit changes from exclusive the same gender to mix or cross-gender supervision, the opposite gender staff is required to verbally announce their arrival on the unit. The National Prison Rape Elimination Commission reported in 2009 in a survey of three Midwestern prisons for women, only about one-third of sexual abuse victims reported the incidents to prison officials because they feared retaliation. And I've seen that 
a lot of times. I work in cosmetology, so I had not worked, but my vocation was cosmetology. And I had a lot of contact with people on the general pop side. So it wasn't as restrictive as EDP, the Youth Offender Program. And I heard and talked to people when I was doing their hair. They were able to have a confident ear to listen to, or to speak to and just vent to and knowing that I would say anything. But I've heard multiple people get involved in something and they want to stop, but they can't because they're threatened and they don't want to miss seeing their family. They have kids that they see on the weekends and they have school that they're trying to get their GED and you can't do that while you're in there. So it's difficult in what they try to choose. Sometimes they'll go to suffering with the abuse and taking that and instead of speaking up for themselves and trying to save themselves. So accordingly, the Prius standards severely restrict the involuntary placement of victims in segregated housing. Any use of segregated housing to protect an inmate who is alleged to have suffered sexual abuse shall be subject to the requirements of 115.43. I don't know how to read statutes. Please forgive me which is inmates shall not be placed in involuntary segregated housing unless an assessment of all available alternatives has been made and a determination has been made there is no available means of separation from likely abusers. If a facility cannot conduct such an assessment immediately, the facility may hold the inmate in involuntary segregated housing for less than 24 hours while completing the assessment. I'm shocked reading that and I've read the investigation before, but seeing it again, knowing how long that they actually do hold you there for investigation. And they say that you can only do it for less than 24 hours is shocking. In addition, any use of involuntary segregated housing for victims must be fully documented and justified. And if any, an involuntary segregated housing assignment is made pursuant to the standard, the facility shall clearly document, one, the basis for the facility's concern for the inmate's safety, and two, the reason why no alternative means of separation can be arranged. Please excuse my problems. I got to get that out. Prisoners who report sexual abuse at Lowell are routinely placed in administrative confinement for days or weeks at a time. While administrative confinement is distinct from disciplinary confinement, the restrictive nature of administrative confinement feels punitive to the prisoner victim. In fact, one of the permitted uses of administrative confinement feels, oh, is for the placement of prisoners who have charges pending against them for, the made, for major rule violations in order to provide safety or security. FDOC's prison rape, prevention, detention, detection, and response procedure, PREA policy, permits the placement of a prisoner of prisoner victims in administrative confinement, which is, as I said, investigation, AC, administrative confinement, they're all synonyms. When the prisoner has indicated a preference to remain in general population, if it has been determined that there are no alternative available alternative means of separation from likely abusers. In such cases, the confinement must be reviewed by the institutional classification team, with 72 hours. The classification team is um, like every group of dorms like has a classification officer. They deal with your visitation. They deal with uh, your intake and they also deal with your release as well and what minimal amounts of transport that they provide. However, the PREA policy also provides that under some circumstances, the normal placement review may take up to five days. So the little notes that are mentioned, it says the FDOC defines administrative confinement as the temporary removal of an inmate from the general inmate population in order to provide for security and safety until such time as more permanent inmate management processes can be concluded. This type of confinement status may limit conditions and privileges as a means of promoting the security order and effective management of the institution. It appears that the officer in charge makes the initial, uh, initial determination that there are no available means of separation from likely abusers. And FDOC's current PREA policy, which became effective on July 31st, 2018, represents a significant improvement over the prior version from 2016, which permitted automatic placement of reporting victims in administrative confinement upon notification of an incident, which is what we see on a normal basis. 
The 2016 PREA policy permitted this placement to continue for up to 72 hours before the facility was required to review placement alternative options and the prisoner's housing preference. The, ho- the prisoner does not get a housing preference in Lowell from what I've seen. The Institutional Classification Team, ICT, will then conduct a 72-hour review of the named PREA victim. The ICT will further review the inmate and the allegation, verify the inmate's housing preference, and reassess the availability of any alternative housing. If the inmate victim remains involuntarily segregated, ICT will ensure proper documentation related to the basis of facilities, concern for the inmate's safety, and why no alternative means of separation can be arranged. So continuing, in any event, in practice, the PREA policy's requirement that the victim have a choice about placement and confinement pending investigation does not occur, as described to us by senior security staff, investigative staff, prisoners, and advocates. Some prisoner victims at Lowell are ultimately placed in administrative confinement for several days or weeks. Between January 2017 and June 2018, 24 different Lowell prisoners who were allegedly victims of sexual misconduct were placed in administrative confinement for days or weeks pending investigation. They spent an average of more than seven days in confinement. Seven different prisoners were held in administrative confinement for longer than a week at a time during that period. Some alleged victims were placed in confinement pending investigation multiple times. Instead of placing alleged victims in administrative confinement, Lowell could temporarily reassign the accused staff or place the accused staff on no-contact status with the prisoner victim or on paid administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigation. Another available option is to move the prisoner victim to another general population housing unit where the accused staff does not have access. And there is a staffing shortage, so that part may be difficult to do, Uh, but I do like the suggestions that it's doable when it comes to saving people's, like, morality yourself and it does need to be going be done regardless of the staffing shortages i'm just saying i know that that would be an easy rebuttal that they would say placement in administrative confinement at lowell involves considerable restrictions on privileges and programming for example telephone privileges are only allowed for emergency situations when necessary to ensure the inmates access to courts or in any circumstance when a call is authorized by the warden or duty warden. This is particularly problematic for victims of recent sexual abuse because absent access to the telephone, the victims have no timely access to the outside com- to the outside confidential emotional support services hotline afforded to general population prisoners. In addition, The lack of telephone access deprives these victims of timely avenues to report retaliation or additional mistreatment to the OIG, TIPS hotline, and the external Gulf Coast Children's Advocacy Center line. And what they mention in there, that part of the posters, um, they're posted by the phone number, and it's a literal poster of the TIPS, the for Priya, and it says here, Priya posters in general population housing units inform prisoners. Lowell Correctional Institution has partnered with Domestic Violence slash Sexual Assault Center of Ocala slash Creative Services, Inc. to provide survivors of sexual abuse with emotional support services. The posters provide a phone number and a post office mail mail, uh, post office box mailing address. And the rule permits an exception for the 72-hour review when the ICT cannot complete its review within the allotted time frame due to the holiday, which happens quite often. If the, if the review cannot be completed within 72 hours, the action of the senior correctional officer shall be reviewed within 72 hours by the duty warden and evaluated within five days by the ICT. Inmates placed into administrative confinement shall not be released from this status until approved by the ICT. In addition, procedures regarding conditions and privileges in administrative confinement provide considerable discretion in restricting privileges generally enjoyed by prisoners in general population housing units. For example, personal property, comfort items, canteen items, and visitation may be restricted if there is an indication of a security problem or at the discretion of the ICT, warden, or warden designee, or from what we've seen, just the officer on duty. 
In practice, multiple prisoners reported to the department that it was typical and expected that they would lose canteen items, access to phones, visitation, programming, and other privileges when they were placed in administrative confinement, which is why they were afraid to make pre-allegations, which was what I was talking about earlier, in which people sacrifice themselves in order to be able to see their family and be able to continue on with their vocation, school, all of those. As discussed below, one prisoner told us that she did not report sexual harassment because it would mean placement in administrative confinement, which would result in her forfeiting a scheduled visit with her son. During the course of our investigation, staff prisoners and victim advocates told us in course that making a report of sexual abuse means going to confinement. Nothing else. While Lowell increasingly utilizes the pre victim housing preference, Form DC 6 2084 to determine whether placement in administrative confinement would be voluntary or involuntary. There's no such thing. It's just involuntary, usually. Nobody, well, usually people would like to stay in the dorm. People don't want to go there unless they're using it as a threat, usually. We were told repeatedly that prisoner preferences are ignored. In November, as I said, in November 2019, a senior correction supervisor informed us that prisoners are always into segregation if they report a pre reported related allegation involving a staff member, even if the inmate says she does not want to go. In 2020, OIG staff informed us that they routinely, but not always, order prisoner victims into administrative confinement for as long as necessary to complete an investigation or determine continuing risk to the victim. OIG indicated that until they have an opportunity to interview the victim, they do not necessarily consider the preferences of the prisoner, and that security staff sometimes fail to accurately document their justification for the placement order. The prisoners, however, perceive this prolonged confinement as punitive, and the effect is to discourage prisoners from reporting sexual abuse. And the note with that says that, OIG staff informed us that the facility sometimes places victims in administrative confinement without such an order being issued by the OIG, and that the facility staff nevertheless will state in their written justification for the placement per OIG. What it's saying there is that the officers there that are on duty do what they want, but then they write down what is expected of them to be wrote down per the paperwork and the documentation that they're supposed to have. And we're going to get right back to this on the next video, starting with Lowell supervisory staff threaten prisoners about cooperating with DOJ personnel on page 21. That's going to get interesting. And I don't want to say I hope you like this video, but I hope that it was able to enlighten you and open your eyes some more about what we as prisoners had to go through and what goes on behind closed doors. And I hope that you were able to get some knowledge out of this and maybe treat your uh, fellow felon that you know of a little bit more nice. So if you want to, please give us follow formidable underscore felon on Instagram, formidable felons on Facebook. Please like and subscribe. And uh, this is next video is going to be part four. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Shalomi homies. <laughs>